Hey guys, it's Colleen here with Soft Concrete Magazine, and I am interviewing the wonderful Robert Ortiz. Hello. Okay. Hi there. Hi. Nice, nice to meet you. meet you. All right. All right. So. so you shorts. I'm wearing shorts right now. It's hot. Do you usually not wear shorts? No. Not in, not in front of people, at least. <laughs> Why not? I don't know. It looks weird. I usually. No. So you just released your album, Ungrateful. Yes. Okay. Now, the title, Ungrateful, kind of leads you many different ways. Now, what do you want to happen when you hear the title, Ungrateful? And what do you want your fans to think? Well, I want them to think that we're grateful now. Um, the, the whole concept of Ungrateful, the name came from uh, kind of just our journey over the last two years. And um, I mean, we've been through hell making the record. We, we, we almost didn't make it. We almost fell apart as a band. And a lot of it were, all of it was our own doing, really. And, um, you know, during the time where we were, you know, succeeding and on this amazing hot streak, the snowball was growing bigger, as they say. And, it, and you know, we had a, a real good shot at crossing over into this other realm of success. And we were squandering it, you know. We had our, our own base pair of Max and on drugs, and we were dealing with that. And, you know, we were becoming very depressed. and not appreciative of what we had in front of us. I would have rather gone home than go and play in front of thousands of people, you know, and I, I was not grateful for the opportunities that happened because I was unhappy. So now we're here at this point, and that's what this record represents. It represents our whole life in a nutshell, and we look at everything we've done and realize how ungrateful we were for every opportunity we were given, and that's what it represents. That's what that the bird, I thought it looked stupid at first, but then when you really dug into the meaning, this bird is essentially death, taking away our crown, and there we are dead and lifeless, and now's our chance to come back to life. Okay, cool. So, um, was Max on the recording process for this album or not? Was Absolutely it TJ? Absolutely not, okay. TJ was. Okay, so the new sound of the album, because I listened to it like from beginning to end, and it was, old, it was a very powerful album, and the continuity was, um, very unique actually because I those one song um, one for the money okay. right yeah because that that has actually people have actually been saying that that is the one song that does not belong on the album do you agree with that or do you think hey fuck you guys well the thing about us is our whole sounds always been very diverse right and um, I think one thing we were proud of with this album was that we kept our diversity but there was a continuity there, as you said. There's yeah. like, it sounds like the same band playing together, just they're trying different things and they have different sounds. It's, it's different styles. We're into a lot of different things, um, but it sounds like one band. Whereas before, I think previous albums, you'd have just completely different sounds on one right. one album. And so, um, one for the money, it's odd because that, that's the one song where I, I, we it's, it's a song that we hate it and we love it. We're embarrassed of that song. It has absolutely no meaning. It's, it's a stupid song. We're in the studio. All we said was, we want a song to get you pumped up and ready to just go like kick some ass, go out to the bars or go out to a fucking football field. And we literally were watching like NBA highlights and football <laughs> highlights. I'm like, yeah, we need something to get you stoked. And that's all it's about. It's about just getting pumped up and having a good time. And, it's not a song that's to be taken seriously, but it's catchy. It stays in your head. It bounces in you, and, and before you know it, you hate it, and then you sing it, and then you love it. And every time you hear someone say, "Are you ready?" and then you just think of that song, "Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready?" Then let's go. You know, I don't know. A lot of fans, uh, surprisingly, a lot more fans are liking it than talking crap on it, which yeah. actually is quite surprising because I thought more people just hate it. Yeah. You know, but, hey. So you recorded this with uh, John Feldman, correct? Yeah. And this was some of it. Some of it. Okay. What What did you not record? No, I'm just saying half of the album was John Feldman, half of it wasn't. Okay. Let's see if I have it. Because I heard that you guys wrote the album and then you went back and scrapped half of it yeah. and then rewrote it. So yeah, which I still have it in here as Black Rodeo. That is Fire It Up, Awaken, which is now Chemical Love. Mm -hmm. Forever, which is now father brother, and uh, yeah, that's, man, 
man, I have all the demos. These are these people haven't even heard the song. So yeah, like six, seven songs we did on our own. Yeah. And then the other songs we did with John Fellman. Um, well, basically what happened was we went in with Fellman and we came up with some great songs. You know, like Man for the Money, yeah. like Picture Perfect, which is epic, and Forget About Me. And you know, we we um, we're really excited about it. But then when we got the album as a whole, we used to do it front to back. We were not satisfied. We just listen to it and we're like, this doesn't represent the whole band. This doesn't represent everything you've done. And so, for those of you who can see, Craig Mapp just almost walked in on this interview just now. But uh, anyways, like we couldn't, uh, we, we weren't happy. We, we weren't going to release something that wasn't completely done and completely represented the band. So we wanted to go back and we felt it needed to be heavier, it needed to be stronger. And so that's why we went back and wrote mostly heavier tunes. And, um, and we wanted to do it on our own. We tried other producers and everything, but it's just like, dude, let's do this on our own. It's our time. And Ungrateful was a song that we did first that was like, no one can tell me what to do. I'm gonna make the drums be as crazy as I want them to be and as held back as I want them to be. No producer can tell me what I can or can't do. And it was, it was amazing. And that, that freedom was just overwhelming. So I, I'm happy with the way it turned out. You know? Right. But John Feldman's a great producer, and I would still love to work with him again. Okay. So, when you talk about the freedom of having and producing your own album, do you think that that was necessary to bringing in TJ on the bass and fully instating Michael on rhythm guitar? Do you think that that was the next step in the writing process in order to fully unleash the creativity that everyone held up inside uh, of them? No. No. <laughs> No, because the writing process has still been the same as it all. It's always been. Monty generally comes up with the majority of the song. He, he, he is the lifeblood of each individual song. He comes up with the majority of all instrumentals. And yeah, we all add our flavor, which, you know, I take his idea of what he wants the drums, the direction they want to go, and then I make them actual drum parts, and I make them make sense, and it becomes a real song. Obviously, Craig's vocals, everything. and. Um, you know, it, it did feel like a team, uh, but doing doing it with John Feldman it still felt like a team. It still it felt great doing it with them. It, it's just all it's just where we were at, and, and uh, giving them the same freedom was the same freedom they gave me. So just because they were not officially in the band, it did change anything by doing it on our own. If it, it, it changed anything for them, it, it also changed it for me. Right. So it was nothing personally towards them because Michael's been recording and writing with this band for five years now on two previous albums. Michael was recording and writing with us. That's why we made him an official member because he's such a big part of it that why the hell is he not a part of it? You know, because he is a part of it. So, you know, that's what we did. There was no reason to, to pull back anymore with him and keep it on this basis of, well, you can do this, you can do this. Like, no, dude, you're a brother, you're important, we need you. And it reflects in our shows, it reflects in our songs. We're a team now. So yeah, it, I mean, it did feel good though doing it on our own. Yeah, so the current lineup is exactly where it needs to be, you'd say? Absolutely. Okay. Um, yeah, it's never easy having a lineup change or anything, but yeah, it's where it needs to be. Okay, so now that you brought on TJ uh, from Motionless and White, how is the relationship between Escape the Fate and Motionless and White? Um, you know, it, it's good. I mean, we, we're still cool with them. Like, uh, we're, we've never been like good friends, even on that tour. TJ was the only one who I was good friends with, but um, we're never like, you know, buddies or anything. But we're not enemies or nothing like that. Or it's the same. It's not like this neutral territory where like we say hi to each other and we're we're cool, we're friends, but not like best friends or anything. It's the same thing, you know. Okay. So you said in a previous interview that this tour is for the fans that actually love and care about us and want to hear us. Would you say that the album that you put out is for those fans too, instead of trying to attract new fans? I, was, I think it's everything, man. I think this album like is bringing back the old fans who stopped caring about us, who said, man, these guys are done, they're old. Like, I, I've, I've Since that interview, I've sat with both sides of the fence. I've sat with the fan who was cared for us deeply, you know, who's been there from the beginning, who has the same debates online that everything we release has, you know what yeah. it is, and, and he said, I stopped caring about you guys, you guys were going to your breakup or whatever it was, you max leaving the man, I don't know what was happening, I, I just stopped caring, you know, and it was sad, you guys are fucking back, 
your new album kicks fucking ass. You guys just kicked ass on stage. Fuck yeah, I'm so stoked right now. That's the old fan, and then a new fan outside of Papa Road Show comes up to me. He's wearing a fucking uh, Seven Dust shirt, and he's like, dude, you know, my girlfriend listened to you back in the day. I thought you guys were fucking fags. This is one quoting him. He's like, I thought you guys were fucking fags, but you, your new shit kicks ass, man. I love you guys now. And so, I mean, I, our music never caters towards anyone. It caters towards us. Whatever it is that makes us happy is what we release, and that's what we did, and I think we're very fortunate in that it is making both sides of the events happy. New fans are coming in that have never been a part of this ride, who've talked shit on us, who thought we were, you know, fags. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And it's making the old fans stoked on us again, you know? Yeah. And, and that's that's really important to me. I'm happy. I'm happy with this. Okay. So, um... We but have... we do have a long road before we win them all back. Oh. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Perf picture perfect, and we watched an interview with Craig that said that it that it was about Monty's friend who died in a motorcycle accident. Yeah. Now that was not by chance, Mitch Luck that died in a motorcycle accident. No. Okay, yeah, because we were talking about that and we weren't sure. So Clarifi clarification, yeah. and a few comments that asked that as well. No, I've never met Mitch Luck. I don't think anyone in the band's ever met him or anything, and you know that's sad and tragic on its own. But that we have no true personal connection to that. And that was about a, a friend he grew up with. Right. So his okay. name was DJ actually. DJ? Yeah. And you rest in peace. So uh, if you could write any movie, what would the plot line be and what would the title be? <laughs> I mean any movie, no but no budget, any actors, it can be anything. Oh Lord, I mean any I time I, 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 you know, are you saying are you saying like I could like a whole new concept or a movie I wish I had made? Uh, let's do a whole new concept because that's more creative. Oh my god, I mean, but you can't come up with a better concept than Batman. That was perfect. The yeah. Dark Knight? Dark Knight was The Dark Knight with Heath Ledger? I mean... Oh yeah, Heath Ledger. It's I mean, Heath come Ledger. Come on, dude. You can't get better than that, you know? So you want, would want to have produced? I would want to do that and take credit for it because it was <laughs> fucking awesome. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I've never really thought about that. I would love to make a movie about my band because shit. <laughs> <laughs> Pay yourself. I'd be the star and I'd be played by, of course, Johnny Depp. <laughs> I need a look-alike, so I'd pick him. And through the eyes of a drummer would be called, but it would be actually interesting and people would like it. And I would have, of course, um, Christopher Nolan, who directed The Dark Knight, I'd have him direct it, and it would be awesome. <laughs> well, look forward to that movie. Um, so, did you have any like stuffed animals growing up, or like a blanket, or anything like that? I actually did. I, have, I still have it. I have Do you this, sleep like, with it on the bus? No, no, no. I keep it at my parents' house because it's too valuable. I won't, I won't taint it by bringing it on this vest. <laughs> I don't know this freaking hellhole. <laughs> I would not want my beautiful little sheep that I've had since I was a child, since I was born. The thing is as old as me. I had it since I was born. It's missing an ear. as a whole. I think it might be missing an eye, but it's still, I still love it. My parents keep it. So every time I visit them, oh my god, it's cute. <laughs> yeah, I know. So, do you have like any lucky piece of clothing that you have to wear before a big concert? I have a couple. Shoot? I have a couple. Um, have I always have to have some sort of jewelry and always have to have some sort of cross. You know, Jesus keep me safe. Are you religious? I, I am. I'm. I would like to say I'm more spiritual than religious, mm -hmm. but yes, in a way, I, I like. I don't know. I'm very strong in my faith, and it's not always easy to do when you're in a rock band. It's usually very yeah. contradicting in its way, but it keeps me steadfast and I go on stage hoping that God can see the energy and message I'm trying to deliver is not negative. You know, even if it's like, hey, let's drink and party, it's not, hey, be a drunk and be an asshole and be an addict. It's like, let's have a good time and that's what our shows are about, it's energy release and having fun with each other. And I hope God can always keep me sane. But I have another thing though that's not so deep. Right. But I always have to wear these. I've had these for like freaking seven years now, or eight years. These are my lucky scarves. I don't play a show without. So why the aviators? Well, because I was once at a, I was in Fremont Street, coming from Vegas, Las Vegas. It's Fremont Street, and they have this show that plays on this giant LED screen that runs the whole length of Fremont Street. If you've 
never been there, which I'm sure a lot of people have. And they do like tributes to different artists and just random shit. And they were doing one, it was Michael Jackson. And I was in high school, I was like 14, 15 years old. I was looking at and Michael Jackson and showed him where he hops on stage and he's just chilling there and people are screaming and he has the aviators on. And I said, holy crap, he's the coolest guy I've ever seen. I need to get some. And I've been a Michael Jackson fan since I was born, but it just hit me right then and I'm standing next to this booth and this booth is selling them for like 10 bucks. Fuck yeah, dude. <laughs> and I get them and then I've been wearing them ever since. It's just part of the aesthetic. Most people would say Slash because that's easy. Obviously, I look up to Slash and I idolize him and I don't care that I look like him because he looks badass. But actually, I was going to Michael Jackson and that's why I started wearing him. I've been wearing him ever since. And now I'm stuck because if I don't wear him, you don't recognize me. I'm grateful. Out now at Target, Best Buy, Hot Topic, iTunes, and Amazon. You heard it. Thank you for tuning in and we will catch you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.